All right. You ready to go, Pastor? I am. You're always ready, huh? Got to do what we got to do. Were you born ready? That, I mean, you got the gift of gab. The Lord has given you the gift, I believe. Right? Is that Would that be fair? a fair assumption? I think so. Oh, there we go. Can you hear the music? I'm never sure if you guys can hear the music. They're very faint. Yeah, I think it's it's the same thing when Gritty plays all his uh, drops. Like we can't hear it when we're on, but then it's on the recording. So That's the magic of remote recording, and this is Roddy Radio, and today we have a very special guest from the No Name Yet podcast. Good, uh, I'm a bit of a fan of yours, more than a friend, I guess. Pastor, is it still pastor then? Is it father? Uh, Are you a father? It's Father Moran. Father yeah. Moran, friar. <laughs> What's the difference between a father and a friar? A friar, um, a f- uh, friar. Uh, so I am a I, I am a Franciscan also, and uh, that means that. Uh, we study and try to follow the the, the ways of Saint Francis, mm-hmm. and uh, the, the the I didn't not take a, a vow of uh, poverty. I took a, a vow of simplicity. Um, so it's charity, obedience, and simplicity. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, if I if I were in a Franciscan order and not ordained a priest, I would be a friar being a ordained priest um i'm still a friar um but i'm also a priest and i'm father moran or father richard father rich and the friars do all those roasts yeah (laughs) yeah those friars do those roasts and the franciscan friars uh follow jesus christ and try to help people out (laughs) So, and uh, uh, the difference between a friar and a monk uh, are monks are generally uh, cloistered, and friars are uh, people of a part of religious orders that intermingle with society. Okay. Do the friars still uh, do the bald spot thing, or what was that about? Like in all the paintings? Yeah, uh, I'd have to. I'd have to look at that. Um, I uh I haven't discovered the reason for that. Yeah, because <clears throat> it looks like they're wearing a yarmulke, but it's actually just a big bald spot. Yeah, which was it's just interesting. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Path. Uh, Father Rich Moran, a uh, man of the cloth, a vow of simplicity. That means you can't buy like anything fancy. Like you have to keep your car. No, no crazy bonus extras. No cyber truck for you. Uh, probably yeah. That that probably be no cyber truck. And I do. Uh, I mean, I, I I live a pretty simple life. I drive a 2012 uh, Mazda three with uh, it's a shifter with six gears, oh. and uh, which I love. I love driving s- stick. So many people love that, and they're and it's like a measure of manliness if you can drive a stick shift. And I'm like, I can make it. With if I have to, but it's not something I've ever enjoyed. It's really hard to text and shift and drive. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you wait till you get on the highway. Well, yeah, um, that, that's when it's, yeah, you, you can just leave it up on, yeah. the, on the high gear. Yeah, but yeah, you have it in cruising gear and yeah, you know, do I mean, what you got to do. And then you can do whatever. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, I don't know. I just, I've, I have driven in the past. I've learned and gotten okay at it. But then, like, it's just, those have been moments. Younger moments where it was like, I don't have a car, so someone let me an old beat up truck and you know, that kind of thing. But yeah, so I uh, I like to share this if you don't mind. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I had to learn, uh, I had learned uh, driving standard very quickly because my uh, prom date um, had an uncle that wanted to drive us up in his uh, to the, the prom in his Lincoln Continental. And uh, which meant that we didn't have transportation home, but uh, my uh, my uh, date's family was going to leave the uh, Renault in the parking lot for me to drive her home. And the Renault was a, st- you know, a standard. Mm-hmm. So my Aunt Patty, 
uh, gave me a crash course. And uh, so my aunt Patty and Uncle Al, my Uncle Al was a race car driver. He was uh, uh, ice. He 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 uh, raced time trials, which you know, just a flat track. He raced um, uh, ice races. He did uh, dirt stock cars, uh, and he started out as a kid and doing um, go karts. And, uh, but my aunt was the real race car driver <laughs> and she taught me how to drive a stick. And I am happy to report that the older I get, the more and more I drive the car like my aunt Patty. Oh yeah. There is no corner I can take too close. Oh wow. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And that you can start uh, drifting on corners and show me that. Right. Right. Uh, but uh it it every day i get in my car i think of her and um you know she she was uh definitely someone who who uh, marched to her own drum yeah uh but there's so many things i loved about her do you come from a long line of uh people that marched to their own drums like hippies and punks and shit uh not really no no cuz you're i mean you're an ordained father but you you know, you wouldn't guess it from talking to you. Yeah. Um, I don't know. You know, I, I mean, I've had people say, I can't believe that you're a pastor. I can't believe you're a priest. Because, I mean, I do have, you know, a pretty, uh, I don't know what you would call it. I don't know, maybe six sense of humor at times. Yeah. You know, I worked, I worked as a police dispatcher for 11 years. I my father was a police officer. My mother worked in police stations. So, you know, you get that that sense of humor where you're laughing at tragedy. Yeah, yeah. You have to. And, That's uh, what I've heard about, like, 911 dispatch and that kind of stuff. You have to. If you're not laughing, you're getting emotionally scarred. Yeah, or pissed off, you yeah. know. Yeah. Uh, people do really crazy and annoying things. Like throw dog poop over each other's fence for 30 years in a row. <laughs> <That's what I'm... laughs> uh, man, I, I became friendly with a priest here in, uh, when I was in my 20s, and I worked at a men's store. We uh, uh, we sold suits and stuff like that, tailored suits. And he would always go in and, and kind of a window shopper, but I knew him from, from the church, uh, Father Raul. And, but he never wore, like, he never wore the collar or anything like that. And he told me, and I, I, and that's when I learned. I, I, I told him I always saw all the, uh, all the other priests wearing that out, out and about. So I just assumed like you had to. And he said, no. He's like, those are the younger guys. They're kind of a little bit cocky. They want to show off. He's like, I would rather go out into the world and people treat me just like anybody else. He's like, people definitely treat you different when when they know you're a priest. Yeah. And uh, they're, we they're... went to dinner once, and uh, you know, I said, well, where do you want to go, Father? And I, I, was, I didn't know. I was like, uh, you want to go Chinese? He's like, well, I like Chinese, but they don't sell booze there. So he wanted to go actually have some drinks and stuff. <laughs> and then he paid for it with like the with a church card. Okay, whoa. Yeah. So <laughs> 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 I think he was trying to reconvert me back to Catholicism or something. Okay, all right. Yeah, um, there, there's, a, there's a debate about wearing the collar. And... Um, I, uh, um, uh, before I returned to Catholicism through the, the uh, Catholic Apostolic Church in North America, uh, I was, uh, ordained in the, uh, African Methodist Episcopal Church. And, um, after Ferguson, um, Michael Brown was killed, um, uh, they had a panel discussion down at Mother Bethel, which is in Philadelphia. It's the place where uh, the African Methodist Church began. It's, AME Church is uh, significant uh, American history. Mm -hmm. and um, But there was a panel discussion, and um, I've since forgotten the name of the, the pastor that, that said this, but uh, she was talking about ministering uh, in Ferguson, and um, one of the things that she did say uh, was that when Ferguson went down and all these preachers showed up, 
uh, there was a variety of reactions, like especially to Jesse Jackson, where they ran him out of town. Uh, they're like, you never, you weren't here before. We don't want you here now. But then, you know, some other young people, you know, saw other preachers coming in with their collars and were like, we don't know why they're wearing those collars, but the only thing that we do know is they're the, they're the only ones not getting clobbered by the police. So we're going to okay. stand behind them. And uh, what she said was that we have suspended wearing our collars so we can reach people where they're at. But we've been reaching people where they're at for so long, nobody knows who we are. Okay. And uh, that really stuck with me. And um, so I'm apt to wear, uh, I don't wear it as much as I used to, but I will put it on just to put it on at times to uh, quote unquote fly the colors. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I imagine you wear them when you work because you work, you still work as a, what do you call it there at the hospital? A chaplain. A chaplain. You still work as a chaplain? I do. Um, I used to wear a, the collar once a week to mm -hmm. fly the colors, but I find in in chaplaincy uh, that sometimes a collar does get in the way with you know certain people. Okay. And so um, I've uh, really, over time, I've really become very comfortable in my role as chaplain. Uh, because it's it's a different role than than being a pastor or a priest. Yeah. I'm not there to evangelize or convert people. Um, what chaplains uh, are trained to do is to engage people's spirituality, however that spirituality is expressed. And some people don't express their spirituality through religion. And so we identify these spiritual resources and 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 uh, qu uh qualify them and and establish how does how does uh your how does your spirit how is your spirituality going to help or hinder your hospitalization okay. and your healing and uh, that's our goal is to establish that and to do whatever we can to foster healing okay that makes sense. And now that you're a father, so now you can't get married since you're a father. Or what? No, the uh, in uh, our see, we're not called a jurisdiction. We're called a uh, no, we're not called a denomination. We're called a jurisdiction mm -hmm. because we are Catholic. Uh, but the Catholic Apostolic Church is not within the hierarchy of Rome. Oh, okay. I thought you were. Uh, but. Um, uh, our our sacraments are considered valid by the the um the Vatican and they consider the Catholic Apostolic Church and I always get the wording wrong but something like uh rogue but valid okay so you and, guys uh, are the, the, not the person one who of us, started it was a things. Roman Catholic bishop now so that means you could whatever happened I've been meaning to ask you this for years now that lady at the bakery that you that you had a fancy to. Did uh -huh. you ever hit her up? No, uh I haven't been at the bakery in a long time. <laughs> so to catch people and, up, you would go to this bakery and there's this lady that, that you were attracted to. Yeah. You just never you yeah. never said anything. What's that? Do you but you never said anything or like made I any never moves. really said anything. Did you guys then... were you guys flirty? Were you like, How were the buns today? and shit like that or uh, yeah, I tried to make some small talk, but it's hard to do that in that place <laughs> because <laughs> because there's just so many people coming and going. Oh, okay. You know, I mean, this is like the famous bread, you oh, know. Okay. So she's always a little too busy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I get that. And, yeah, and, then, and then I caught her on a bad day. Oh, well. Um, no, just like a bad uh, hair day. And uh, I was kind of like, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of turned you petty, off of that, isn't it? Huh? it hey that's the way it goes though i mean you, you have yeah. to be petty you know i mean it's like nobody's perfect but you know you at least try to be i guess i don't know yeah, yeah. so and you said come back to catholicism so you grew up catholic you were raised catholic. i did were I you was, rose, uh, were you raised uh in this apostolic catholic or roman catholic roman catholic, roman catholic. So you, were you baptized and, and all that? 
How yes. how far did you get? Did you do your confirmation and all that? I did my confirmation. Yeah. Yeah. I got as far as first communion, and then I was like, uh, "You got as far as what?" First communion. Oh, was, first communion. Yeah, okay. Like, I never got. I never did the uh, confirmation. The first communion is awesome though, because they would give you that wine. Mm-hmm. And then I, for a couple of years, when I was in like my early twenties, I volunteered with a choir because there was this girl I liked there. You know, it's funny. I ended up um, linking up with her sister instead, who was also <laughs> in the choir. <laughs> And uh, the best part of being in the choir was we we got to go f- up first for communion, so nobody else like you don't have to drink everybody else's spittle, mm-hmm. and you know the, the the chalice was filled all the way up to the top at that point, so I'll take a nice nice long swig of that, uh huh. You know, now there are there was one father that came through that had um he was an he was an alcoholic, so we couldn't do the wine. He did juice, and I didn't like going to church when he was around. Yeah, I'm surprised they they even did that. But yeah, um, but isn't it the belief is in the sacrament in the sacrament that you're you're calling down the Holy Spirit? So I mean, I mean, if push come to shove, you were like in some dire situation and you wanted to do, hold a communion, and you were like stuck in your home or something, and all you had was like Pepsi and Oreos. With enough faith, couldn't that be your communion? Um, I I would imagine that you could do that. Um, now, I mean, I would have to actually research that. Uh, however, um, if if the need was there, and that uh, God sees all. Uh, that God knows intention and knows heart, and um, and so if God knows that that's what that's all you had, and your intention was to perform this sacrament in dire need, then it should yeah, be valid. And, and, well, that know, sounds I mean, rogue, but valid. What, you know what's dire? You know, um, yeah. The bombs are falling, or yeah, yeah, that kind of thing, or like a you know, earth, or or you just stuck earthquake. in the house for a couple of days because of the snow, or the COVID. Yeah, yeah, that that came up actually. Yeah, COVID um, situation. Yeah, uh, yeah, we were told by our bishop. I was uh, African Methodist at that point. Like, no, don't tell people to get crackers, and you know, you're not going. You can't consecrate through Zoom. You know. <laughs> <laughs> So what I did, uh, you know, I got my car. Uh, I consecrated the communion here at my oh, house. Okay. Um, and I drove it out to Utica, which was 70 miles. And I left it in paper bags on people's porches. Okay. So when we did communion over Zoom, uh, we all had it. That brought up, a that sparked a memory, actually, when my grandmother was super old and never and couldn't leave the house anymore. It was like mm-hmm. once a week, uh, I don't think he was a priest, I think he was a, a deacon, would show up with with uh, the, the the wine, with the communion stuff, and, and, um, and some holy box, knock on the door, he'd come in and give her like just like a quick service, and uh, you know, she'd do her communion, and then he'd leave. Yeah. It was like a service for like old people and sick people like that. Well, and if if you don't mind me making a public service announcement, mm-hmm. that uh, for the audience, if you have elders uh, that used to go to church and they can no longer get out, um, please encourage them to have themselves or have you reach out to the churches that they used to go to and inquire about visiting ministries mm-hmm. and uh say you know if they're still interested in in that community you know uh, could you please remember me and how whatever way you can because a lot of churches will come visit yeah um and i just run into so many people as a chaplain that as soon as they get sick they're like oh i can't go anymore um you know they they don't reach out to the church and some of the churches don't unfortunately don't follow up yeah but a lot of churches do too 
and it's just it 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 it's heartbreaking to me uh that you know some elders just go without uh because they because they haven't asked yeah yeah and some people might not even be aware of that like i said i mean i remember seeing that as a kid and this was in mexico and you know church is so feel the feeling of of church and mass and and even just the building itself of a church is just so different so somber when you go to i think maybe it might be just because it's more of a devout country um maybe maybe the area maybe here maybe out like i don't know in uh what's a really uh catholic area in the u.s the uh like uh, new england area or something I just, uh yeah i would say the northeast like if you um, go to the churches there it might be about the same they're more cathedral like because that was the thing mm -hmm. you'd walk into the church in 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 the town in the city my my parents grew up in and it's this big echoey chamber of a church and so you you know any cough echoed any giggle echoed anything you know and it just felt so more like a lot more somber and here mm -hmm. in my town like our church is a, a log cabin and so the, the acoustics were completely different. It didn't feel as serious. We'd go mm -hmm. and have a good laugh. One time I, my, they were passing the collection plate and my oldest brother handed it to my youngest brother. And I don't know who they blame each other, but it slipped and like it fell and all the money fell out. Uh -huh. And I just laughed nonstop. Like, I can't imagine that happening. That'd be horrifying if that happened in the big cavernous yeah. churches of, of Mexico, but it was funny here. Right. Yeah. I went to, I was dating this girl who uh, belonged to uh, the Reformed Church up in uh, up in Glenville, on the top of the one mountain, and uh, you know, first you walk in the church, and it was all white, and uh, you know, the sun shines coming through the windows, yeah. and I'm like, wow, this place is bright, and you know, I grew up in a Catholic church, and um, so then they're talking about uh, the reason I went was to see her get this award, right, and. Um, so they give her her award and people start clapping and I'm like, what are they doing? <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. It was just like, people don't clap in church. But as I found out, especially as a African Methodist that yes, a lot of people clap in church. Yeah. Yeah. A, and I remember that kind of started happening here. And there was this one priest who was from, where would this be? They would. They said he was from Tierra Santa, which was some holy land. I don't know if he's from, from Jerusalem. I don't know where the hell he was from, but he, um, he was really serious. He first the the guy that played the guitar in the choir and that led the choir started playing one of the hymns and he stopped him. He said that one's supposed to be in. It's it's a waltz time and you're playing it all wrong, and he made him change it, and it was just really awkward, and so. And then he got mad because people started clapping. So mm. next Sunday, he pulls the old organ that was collecting dust in the back of the church. He pulls it up to the front, tells the choir to sit this one out, and he just played all the hymns on the on the organ. It was really, and I was like, God, man, <laughs> like you're just taking it back to the old school for us. I like it. <laughs> the guy was a jerk too. He told this kid he looked like a drug dealer, like a little kid, like an eight year old. Oh, really? Yeah, he was like... This is a Catholic? Yeah. Wow. And I was like, God, he didn't last long here. I think people just complained and they moved him, but... Yeah, yeah. I, I, I've, I've, I've heard about and I've, I have met some very headstrong preachers. Um, and I, I, I wouldn't... Uh, my expectation would be would be wouldn't be to, that would happen in a Catholic church, but maybe a more expressive Protestant. But hey, I guess it can happen anywhere. Yeah, yeah. This guy just seemed very old school. Very what's the word like? Uh, I don't know. Just he. I don't know. And it's especially coming from where he came from, he's you know supposedly just wanted everything the way it was, and it's like well. Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, there's this video on YouTube. Uh, it's a preacher. Uh, that died pretty young. Um, his name is uh, Nathan Simmons. And uh, I watch this video every so often to crack myself up. Um, they're out, they're having a tent meeting and the choir starts singing this song and he gets up and he's like, stop, 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 <laughs> stop. Nobody wants to hear this tired song over and over and over again. 
get yourselves together and think of something else to sing so we can praise the Lord. And he walks back. <laughs> oh, geez. Yeah, I, I mean, love that video. It was kind of the same way this guy telling us to stop. Yeah. And then when I was in that choir, when I remember that, that priest was, I mean, it was not as insanely strict like this, but he was a little bit more strict. And he had us, he had the choir. It was a bunch of girls, you know, teenagers, early 20s. And he uh, had them stay after, and he told them all that they needed to start dressing a little bit more modestly. Long, not the, don't come with those skirts as short as they do. Don't be showing so much cleavage and this and that. And I was like, then you're just ruining all the fun for me. Yeah, that's it's like that, I could see his point of view, issue. but I'm like, you know, but yeah. Well, the the person that was my mentor, I call my father in ministry. Um, that became an issue at the church that he pastors. And um, he he brought the Stuart board together and they deliberated on that. And uh, what they decided is if someone came to the altar rail to receive communion and they were they uh, were dressed showing a lot of skin, that they would cover them with a, a, a shawl. Oh. And... Um, they lost a couple members because of that, but yeah. they, they made a decision and they stuck with it. Yeah. And it is a, a hard call because it's, you can see why, but you can also see the other side of it. Like if someone wants to go to church, why gatekeep that, you know? Well, yeah. No, it's a, it's a difficult issue. Um, you know, when I went to Israel, uh, there were certain churches that you could not enter with shorts. And um, I actually liked that, um, you know, having to, having to dress modestly and to to show uh, some respect uh, for the space. Yeah, uh, I actually appealed to me. Um, not having to do it here in America. Yeah, you know. Uh, the other side of that too, though, I think. I mean, I when I used to go to church, we used to get you know, we had our Sunday best and, uh, but sometimes you'd see people showing up in, in just the raggedy old t-shirts, shorts, stuff like that. But they seemed a lot more into it and more into their faith than, than I ever was. Yeah. So it's okay. like, who's yeah. getting more out of church? The guy that, that combed his hair and, and put on his best shirt or the guy that just rolled out of bed and believes in God and, and his, uh, and his salvation. Right. You know, I, there's a church, a Baptist church around here, um, and I was I was doing a a, a service at the uh, YMCA for men, mm -hmm. and uh, so I I knew this guy. I mean, he lived lived at the YMCA, and he was uh, he was a wreck. Uh, you know, he's uh, mentally ill, uh, off his meds a lot, urinated himself mm -hmm. a lot. Um, but the one time I went to go visit this Baptist church, uh, where everybody was dressed to the nines, I mean, it was known as the Sididi Baptist church in, uh, Schenectady. They had a chair for him. He was the last person I expected to see at that church, but they had a chair for him and he was there mm. and, uh, they took care of him. They were very attentive to him. And I'm like, well, that. That speaks volumes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. I thought you were going to go, I thought that was going to go in completely other direction. That's awesome, actually. Yeah, yeah. Now, when you were a kid, was it like that, too? Did you guys have to, your Sunday best, and you had to sit up straight and don't get close to the altar? I remember, late, like, that, that bugged me even. Even as a, now, like, a non-believer, it still bugs me when I see kids running up on the altar. It's like, it's like, you just don't do that, you know? Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think the the you know the strictness came more from the the community of people assembled. Mm -hmm. uh, that my parents uh, we weren't we weren't every Sunday churchgoers. Um, they just they really gave it their best shot. Um, you know, my dad worked nights. He was mm -hmm. a policeman. He worked two and three jobs at a time. My mother had to work. Um, you know, like my sister and I, Gen X, we were, we were latchkey kids. Yeah. Um, so they did the best that they could. They made sure that we had a religious instruction. 
And then off and on, I would go to church by myself with a friend. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I they got uh, they got enough church into me. Yeah, 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 and and that's the I guess you know it's funny you say latchkey kids because I was just thinking about that the other day how that it's really hard for that to exist nowadays. Yeah, like even my with my kids, it's like it would be very frowned upon. I would be risking losing the custody, the little custody I have, if they had to stay home for, you know, one or two hours by themselves. Right. And that's the way we were, though. We'd get home from school, and it wouldn't. We'd be here four or five hours by ourselves. And we'd, yeah. You'd, we'd heat up some leftovers, have a snack, you know, watch TV, kind of in and out. And I think it made us more responsible. And I think so. And when it yeah. came to church too, sometimes if if my parents. We're working on a Sunday. A lot of times we would still go. My older brother would round us up and, and we'd go. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think back of, you know, of growing up and, uh, I mean, now, now, you know, I live in my parents' home. I live with my parents. Mm-hmm. Um, um, I'd moved out to the West coast, moved back. I was going to get my own place. And I never left here. So that's why I'm here. Um, but you know, the, the elementary school I went to is now a condominium. Uh, but it's three doors down from my house. Okay. So, you know, my sister and I would walk three doors down and in the house, lock the door. Um, we, you know, the village of Scotia, where I live, had something called the block parent program that if you were a black parent, you would put a sign on a front facing window. And if you, you if a child was in trouble, they could run to a black parent's oh, okay. house and. At one time, we live on a dead end. The Mohawk River's right over here. Uh, some kids were fishing, and the one kid went like this. And when he went like that, the oh. the hook stuck in his friend's eye. Wow! And they ran to our house because we had a black parent placard. You got him some help. Would you get him to the hospital? Yeah, we called the we called the fire department. They came down, and you know, I don't remember how, if they. I, don't, I doubt they called an ambulance. They maybe called the kids' parents, but yeah, we got them some help. Yeah. So, See, like, the, that, you know, the community was different. I think, know? yeah, even back then when I was growing up, there was all there was signs, those uh, safe place signs at different stores, different businesses had those. You don't see those. Oh, I anymore. remember that. Yeah. Yeah. I remember it was like a picture, like an image of like a big person holding a little person, I think, something like that. And yeah. those would be kind of in different places. You don't really see a lot of that. You still see some community watch signs here where I live, but mm-hmm. I don't know how accurate those are because in the community I lived when I was living in the city a couple of years ago, there was a sign like that on our corner, but I didn't know any of my neighbors to that extent. I never knew who was part of this community watch program that we were supposedly protected by. So, mm. but, but yeah, I don't think the latchkey kid stuff exists anymore. So your dad was a cop? Yeah. Yeah. And so your dad was a cop, and you're a uh, and you're a priest, but um, but you're very much. How do you how did you end up getting into like punk rock? Uh, I just uh, Were you uh, rebelling I was in, uh, against the all the shows at uh, in high school, mm-hmm. and uh, a good portion of the people in the theater department were punkers. And uh, I was exposed to all this music that uh, I had never heard before. And I I, just, I loved it. That makes sense. Yeah. Do you still do you like newer punk rock still or not? Uh, I I listen to it. Um, I I really have the the only person that I mean they've been around a long time. The only people that are producing new stuff. Anti flag. Uh, yeah. I like them. Um, but you know I listen now and again, and I like that. That sounds good. That sounds good. Uh, it's just, you know, ministry is, can be so consuming that, uh, like following music or, you know, that kind of, that stuff a lot of times goes down by the wayside. When you said ministry, I thought you meant ministry, the band. Oh, well. (laughs) Then I realized what you were talking about. I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. And, uh, some ministers are better than others at, you know, having lives, uh, mm. I try my best. 
Wow. Yeah, mm. I, I like the the follow. I like to follow certain shows. Like the Boys is you know is back for another season. Um, so you at least do that some of that stuff. I'm trying to yeah. get more into to like the rock scene here in in my hometown and stuff, which is finally kind of seems like it's going through a little bit of revival right now. So. So I, I mean, I was that same kid, you know, going to shows and stuff growing up, and uh, something that attracted me, of course, and I'm assuming you too, because you're also a very politically minded person, is that political message in a lot of these punk rock songs. Yeah. yeah. Were you, Were you always more of a rebel when it came to your uh, politics? Um, it, in a way, uh, I, I kind of followed in my family's footsteps. Uh, you know, my grandparents uh were liberal minded and uh they were they're were very kind and gentle people and never judged anybody mm -hmm. um and then my father uh was uh a union rep for a while oh wow. and um you know i mean i really believed in you know um making um uh, uh you know have, have, you know, offering people who didn't, who were uh, disadvantaged and didn't have enough to, you know, to take care of people in the country. And uh, I've always been anti war. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and now, you know, uh, I mean, the, the, the conflicts and the fights back in like the 80s and 90s just seem so reasonable now compared to what we've got. It's 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 funny to think of the things we thought were unjust, you know, even twenty years ago, were really nothing compared to what's going on now. Yeah, and of course you're and you're voting for uh, Trump, right? This November? No, I'm voting for Jill Stein. Jill Stein, tell me about Jill Stein. So she is the Green Party candidate uh, for president. She ran in a uh, 2012 and in 2016, and. Uh, you know, I find her to be a very inspiring person. Uh, she's a physician from Massachusetts, and uh, her and her vice presidential candidates have uh, did not uh, worry about getting themselves arrested, which they did on several occasions. Uh, you know, the first time I ever saw her arrested was when her and Sh Shuri Hankala, her vice presidential candidate, uh, tried to. Uh, walk into the hall in Hofstra University where the debates were taking place because they were going to get on the stage and they handcuffed him and arrested him and then sat him in front of a, a air conditioner for a few hours and then let him go. Wow. That's see, that's activism. That's like real activism. Yeah. yeah. You don't really see that now. You see a lot of marches yeah. and stuff. Do you think these mar when people do marches, does that really affect anything? Other than um, traffic in a lot of ways no especially like when something happens say here in schenectady that's a city or right over the bridge and you, you know uh say something happens nationally and everyone gets together and they protest i mean I, I don't know what that does except bring people together i mean the community aspect of it can be good the yeah. networking aspect of it can be good but um like when you when you hear people out there in um you know the podcast land and and that advocate for general strikes or advocate for mass marches in Washington um I really think that that those are really the only things that have an impact yeah um because you know you speak a lot you hear a lot of people talking about speaking truth to power and I'm 100% fully in agreement with Noam Chomsky that power doesn't care. Power doesn't give a shit. And and unless you can threaten them with something, they're not going to listen. Not even going to listen. Yeah. And, and they don't care. Um, you know, 70% of this country is, is fed up with the wars. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they don't care. And I don't know what it takes. And, and people are so busy. You know, uh, like you hear some people say, you know, that uh, the American public has been so anesthetized. I can I always have a hard time saying that word anesthetized mm -hmm. um, by, 
you know, TV and, and, and work and family and, you know, and every, you know, like what at the hospital now, you know, it's just what I've seen over the last eight years that everybody is so busy. They don't there at times they don't even have time to say hello. Yeah. And that's real. They don't have time to say hello. And so what's going on, you know, in our foreign policy is the last thing that's on people's minds even though we're becoming dangerously close to nuclear war. Do you think it's it's the American way, it's the ambition of a better life, that this uh, promise of a better life, that if we work hard enough, but it's really all a bunch of hoopla, and that's what happens. We end up get, getting too busy, and we never really advance in our life. And we focus um, on, on too much on the busy part of the day to where we can't help affect any changes. Yeah. Uh, I... I I, I think, uh, you know, that expression, both and, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, there was a lot of opportunity in this you, and, and, you know, people take, you know, my critique on the government and the country. Like I hate America. I don't hate America at all. Yeah. I mean, when I meet people face to face, whether they're voting for Trump or they're voting for Biden or they're voting for Jill Stein or they don't care and they're not voting there's some really great, nice people out in the world. And the majority of people out in the world are nice. Yes. You know, and, and, you know, uh, and they're just, you know, they're just trying to, to, to make it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I just think that there's a lot of things thrown in our way by the powers that be and the division, it, you know, they, they keep, you know, I mean, what 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 great actors and actresses that this government has spent the last 40 years desperately trying to divide the country, and they've been quite successful. Yeah. Um, and then they and then they stand before the American population and they say, "Oh my God, we've never been so divided." And they wring their hands and this and that. And like it's so our it's exactly fault. the way you want it. Yeah, and and they act like it's our fault. Like we're the ones that divided ourselves or each other and uh, you know yeah. and to the earlier point i think if if you didn't care about the country if you hated the country you would love where the country's at right now you wouldn't be right. trying to change you wouldn't be talking about doing something to change things because this is the perfect place to be if you hate the country the country is in a perfect place for for our enemies and yeah. so and so yeah i mean the, with the division you and i was telling you about it the other day the other night um here where I live, I have, and I've had this theory for a long, long time, that the vast majority of white people here in Idaho are, they're not all racist, but they are all supremacists. Because those are two different things. The, the, you know, most of these white people will be nice to any of us minorities and treat us well. They'll be, a, they'll be good. They'll be friends. But in their minds, they're still better than us. Mm. That's what makes them supremacists. They think they're the supreme beings. So, you know, then we have our fair share of racists. But last time Trump was in office, you start seeing a lot of the hellscape come out. You know, our, I mean, my neighbor started shouting, uh, started calling us spicks and beaners and shit. They didn't have the balls to do that before and they didn't have the balls to do that after. Yeah. That's when the supremacist becomes a racist. Mm -hmm. And so that's why when I hear, I mean, I have friends that are Mexican who are Trump supporters because they hate Biden. And I'm like, you dumb motherfucker. Like you're going to, you're, you're going to allow this to happen again. You're going to allow us to walk these streets in fear again. And they always, and they never said shit. To, nobody ever said shit to me when I was by myself or with friends. Mm -hmm. They always did it when I'm with, when I'm with my kids, when I'm with my mother when they know I'm not going to be so ready to react or to jump into action. Mm -hmm. They know when to prey on us. And that's what's going to happen if, if Trump wins again. So I'm not much of a Biden fan either, but at least we're not getting hassled like we were before. Right. And to have people say, oh, the economy was so much better. It's like, are you, you're telling me five years ago you had a million bucks in the bank and now you don't? You were mm -hmm. just as broke five years ago as you are now. Right. 
Lord knows I am. Well, 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 now we all have higher wages. We do. I'm making a lot more money now than I did five years ago, but everything is a lot more expensive. So I'm still living that same, I'm still walking that same poverty line. I took, I never took a vow of, uh, of simplicity, but I, mm-hmm. but I'm living a simple life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sometimes life can do it for you. Yeah. And so that was, yeah. that, that's why I'm like, I'm just urging people that anyone that can vote to not vote Trump mm. because that's, because it, it no, really that's a, a that's a good perspective to hear. Um, you know, um, like I've had this conversation, you know, um, with my, with my, uh, niece and my sister, um, I was saying I was voting for Jill Stein and my niece immediately said, that's a vote for Trump. And I said, it's not a vote for Trump. It's a vote for Jill Stein. Um, you know, I'm, I'm tired of, 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 you know, the fear mongering and not being able to, uh, vote, um, for somebody that represents my politics for believing and, in democracy is what it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also I said, you know, if I was in a swing state in a swing County, um, I might wrestle with my vote. Uh, but I'm not, I live in a d- democratic dictatorship. Um, you know, I live in New York state and I live in, um, I forgot what I am, the 112th of the 120th congressional, vic- uh, district, which was gerrymandered that the Democrat is always going to win. Mm-hmm. Um, so even if I wanted to, you know, uh, vote for somebody else, they're not going to win. And, um. So I can vote for whoever I want and, you know, for president and the electoral votes are going to the Democrat. So, and, you know, I encourage the audience, if, if you really do want to see third parties excel uh, and you live in a red state, a solid red state or a solid blue state, um, and you want to throw your, uh, a vote behind a third party, a third party win is not winning the presidency. A third party win is getting 5% of the popular vote in the nation, which entitles that third party to be on the debate stage with the Republican and the Democrat the next on the next four-year cycle. So, you know, it's all about getting numbers and not and not getting a lot of numbers comparatively to winning the presidency. Mm-hmm. And it's it's you know, um every time every time third parties get a little power, they they change the rules, but you got to keep agitating um in, in whatever way that we can uh these this uh two-party duopoly everybody complains uh, about the bipartisan way that things are now but nobody wants to take these steps to change it nobody wants to take the risk and that's why that's why i bring up the situation what the situation is going to be if trump wins because as far as the government it's going to be the same damn thing if he wins or biden wins because to me both republicans and democrats it's the same thing they have the well, same it's one war party. Yeah, they have the same. They have the same agenda. They they all want to do the same thing. They all want to go to war and 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 the oil and the and everything. It's all the same. They don't have different goals. The only difference is that they want they want the same thing for them as the other ones guys want the for themselves. So, so to me, it is. It's it's the same thing except socially, it's going to be a, a hellhole again here mm-hmm. here anyway. Yeah, but. But, and that's, yeah, and you know, and that's, what, and that's another thing. It's like, I mean, and I'm sitting here, I've never been, I've never voted my whole life. And now, and for the past, what, uh, going on nine years, I've, I haven't been able to vote because of a felony on my record. But you're telling me I can't vote because of a, because of one felony charge. I can't vote for president anymore. I can't vote for anything anymore. But a motherfucker with a bunch of felony charges, he can be president. Hmm. Like that, well, then I won't vote. I'll just run for president. (laughs) (laughs) There you go. 
you know, and, and that's, and, you know, and I've said that before too, I could run for president. You know, I'm, this is the first election year that I'm old enough to run for president. And that, and you know, that, that's another complaint I hear a lot is, you know, well, we have all these old, old white men in the white house. Well, I'm none of those things. I'm not white or old. Mm -hmm. So I think I'd be a good candidate. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a curious thing, you know, um, I think there's a lot of people out there that, um, that would, that the want that would want to go to Washington and do the right thing. And then you look at the entire squad, um, uh, that just rolled over and played dead. Um, the one independent voice in, the uh, in the Congress is, uh, Massey. Yeah, he spoke out against the uh, Israel lobby, and now his wife's dead. Yeah, yeah, it's all, it's all mafia, man. It's all mob. You know, it's like, um, you know, I I've listened to. Uh, do you know who Ralph Nader is? Yeah. So you know, Ralph Nader uh, ran for president in two thousand. They blame him for Bush winning. Um. Uh, Ralph Nader has all these plans on on how uh, the people could take power back, and uh, he really kind of points out how easy it would be if you got enough people to commit. Yeah. Um, and in 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 these several different books he's written, and uh, you know, and it's just you know, over the years, you just say people's minds just aren't there. Yeah. And that, you know. that goes back to what we were saying before. We're all so busy that yeah. instead of taking this, you know, few hours to educate ourselves and realize the steps we need to take, it's a lot easier to just say, well, I either like this guy or like that guy. That's easier. Yeah. And it's, you know, when you think about, you know, ideologically that our country is very diverse mm -hmm. and that. Uh, you know, that we've got, we have these 50 states that have been able to, up to this point, you know, hold it together. Um, yeah, it, it, I mean, it is fascinating. It just wonders, it, you know, it makes me wonder, like, how much longer can this experiment continue? Yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, and that's something I've always said, at least, you know, at least probably since high school. I'm like, this, this, this country is way too big for its own good. Yeah. You know, cause the, the laws that make sense where you live, cause you we're on completely opposite sides of the country. Yeah. You know, they're not going to make sense of the, where I live. Cause it's way too, I mean, the culture is different. The, the terrain's different. We live off of different things. Geog you know, geographically is completely different. And so it's, it's really hard to keep it together. You see countries yeah. in, in Europe that seem a little bit more prosperous. Well, why is that? Because their countries are the size of one of our states. Right. It's a lot easier to keep those, you know, that amount of people and that amount of terrain united than mm -hmm. this giant land mass. So. Yeah. And, you know, and I live in New York, which uh, at one point, I mean, I don't know if we've moved up or moved down, but. Back in the 80s and 90s, uh, the New York state government was considered one of the, uh, was the fifth most corrupt government in the world. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and at the time, you know, our, 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 uh, our roads were getting paved. Um, uh, people were being put to work and, um, you know, and when people said things about New York, you're like, you know, piss off, you know. Uh, we might be corrupt, but uh, throughway is looking really good. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know? <laughs> at least there was corruption, but at least there was something for the yeah. people. Yeah, yeah. Well, now not so much. Yeah, now so, it's now there's still a large amount of corruption, but you're not getting squashed. Yeah. yeah, you can't just be corrupt. You got to take care of business too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, that makes sense. See, and that's what I'm saying. The, the government is just all mob, all mafia. At least the mafia. At least the actual mob, Italian mob, at least they took care of their people. At least other yeah. crime syndicates have taken care of their people. The stuff that goes on in Mexico with the cartels, they take care of the poor while the government yeah, doesn't. Yeah. So I, I had a boss that um that kind of put corruption in 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 perspective. 
uh, for me. He he grew up, or he didn't grow up, he was living in Syracuse and he was working for this bank. And there was this this guy that was, you know, he'd been a reelected mayor, you know, several, several. I mean, he was one of these really long term mayors. And um, a bunch of people in the city got together and they took him down. They exposed all this corruption, you know. He was paying this, you know, giving the contract to this guy, paying this guy, right? So they get all these people. All these people are elected. They're not on the take, yada, yada, yada. And the city went down the tubes. Yeah. That's that cause and effect like that. Yeah. That makes sense. And, you know, I mean, it's like, okay, if they're corrupt, but they're taking care of business, then... What are you going to do? Yeah. Um, you know, I'm not expecting people to be perfect, but, you know, this federal government doesn't, could care less about the American people. Yeah. It's like a very crude example of that is uh, Rudy Giuliani helped, uh, he, I, I believe, I might be wrong, but he played a big part in... Uh, in the Donald Trump thing with uh, where they took down a lot of the hooker sites off of the internet. So okay. it's a lot harder to get a hooker nowadays. And then next thing you know, we got pictures of him with a hooker. <laughs> it's like, you're going to keep the hookers for yourself and not let us have hookers. Do you mind if I do my rant about Rudy Giuliani? I would love that. So, Rewind all the way back to, I don't know, when he was elected mayor of New York City. But here, you know, we heard all these stories about, you know, this guy is close to the mob, blah, 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 blah. He's conservative. He's uh, He rules with an iron fist. He's no good. Then 9-11 came. And the world, not the United States... The world looked to Rudy Giuliani for leadership because nobody trusted the Bush that was in the White House. He was an idiot. And when the idiot came to New York, who shined in the pictures? Rudy Giuliani. He was a hero. Rudy Giuliani was the man during 9-11. He could have stepped out of politics and been the man for the rest of his life. But what did he go do? He became a freaking buffoon mm -hmm. for a TV reality show host who became president. Yep. And he, nobody even takes him seriously anymore. And it's like that fall from grace, it, it just yeah. can show you how misdirected people can be. Yeah. That was, I mean, 9 11 was like the event of my youth, you know? So, and, and so when I, when I saw the pictures of him with the hooker and then like his, uh, his hair melting off of his head and it, yeah. it was, it really, it, it felt, it almost felt bad. It almost felt yuck, man. Like, like that was a hero. Like it's like you said, that was someone that we in our that I that's what we learned about him. He was the the man. Yeah. And like you said, he could have stepped out, and we could have just remember remembered him for his greatness. And instead, now we have all these other things. Yeah. All this buffoonery. He could he could have sat on the sidelines. Presidents might have called him. Senators might have called him. He could have been a pundit. You know. Yeah. Just 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 lived out his life as a hero. But I don't know. Yeah. That's kind of sad. But, you know, you get what you deserve, I guess, sometimes. Yeah. So. The hair melting thing. I mean, I, I thought that was just so apropos. That was nuts, yeah. And I'm hoping that the Lord had taken <laughs> his finger and made those scoops that were lighting him a lot hotter than they needed to be. And that's why he started <laughs> melting. Wow, that was so insane. But, I mean, yeah, and I remember when George Bush won for president that's about the time i really stopped believing in democracy just because like popular vote you know was all about al gore and then yeah but we still got the bush 
with that face of his. And now he's a painter. Yeah. Have you seen his art? Do you like his art? I I I really haven't paid attention. Um I I I just I find it appalling. Um the how forgiving uh some people can be. And uh you know, especially like people close to me that you know would become deranged at the at the at the utterance of George W. Bush and now they've, you know, eaten up this you know you know these 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 plays you know with the ellen degeneres sitting next to him in a, some box at some sporting event and yeah. um mrs obama giving him a piece of gum and you know he's a war criminal yeah the man cannot travel outside of the united states because somebody can uh issue him a warrant and arrest him for war crimes but we're supposed to think he's just this really nice old man who used to be our president yeah yeah nice really nice gentleman i think that's what they try to portray him as is like a gentle kind soul right and he destroyed he destroyed iraq mm -hmm. it was a modern secular uh country in the middle east where women had equal rights and I remember listening to this woman on National Public Radio talk about what had been destroyed. And it's just like, you know, and, and, and that's part of our plan yeah. is to keep the Middle East unstable so people are not fighting with Israel. And so... So it was worth it to destroy an entire country, kill a million people, and birth defects keep increasing in Iraq. Babies' organs are 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 grow outside of the body cavity because we use depleted uranium. Mm. That's that's our legacy. Yeah, that's what the government has made our legacy around the world. And I don't, I don't hate the United States. I hate what our government has done. I mean, why, why are we're just responsible for hellscape after hellscape after hellscape? And it's, it's just, uh, uh, it's overwhelming at times. And and I know that you know that my religion informs me that, you know that uh, the you know the enemy has. Uh, full reign over the planet. Uh, and other people, you know, will tell me, well, why do you get so upset? We're all, you know, we all want to get to heaven. If the end times come, uh, then that's better for us all in the long run. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's our goal. We want to get to heaven. But while we're here, aren't we supposed to be taking care of this creation that we were gifted by our creator? Yeah. They and are that. not each and every one of us a child of God? That's what I say. Everybody focuses too much on the afterlife and not what we're actually doing now. Yeah. Stop trying to get to heaven and instead try to make this heaven. Try to make this be what we were promised mm -hmm. yeah see that's you the, know that's that's the father moran i wanted to get man you getting okay. yelling and shit that was good yeah and you know um I'll, I'll just speak honestly i know that this this makes some people crazy when i've shared it with them but what are we gonna do for eternity you know i mean <laughs> Uh, I mean, is, is 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 paradise not going to get a little boring after two hundred and fifty thousand years? Yeah, I don't know, you know. But uh, I mean, because eternity is a lot. You don't. I think they realize what eternity means. Because yeah, it's like, oh well, I want to. You know, some people have that vision of heaven. Well, in heaven, you can do whatever you you like to do all the time. But that's going to get boring. And so let's say you switch, you know, maybe your thing was basketball, but you're bored. Oh, well, now you can play hockey. 
That's going to get boring. You're going to run through all the sports, through music, through art. You're going to run through everything eventually Mm -hmm. because eternity is eternity. That, and I always thought that was stupid too, because it's like, what if what I like to do is like, like do drugs and jack off? Am I going to be able to do that in heaven? Like, if that's my favorite thing to do. Oh, Lord, help me. (laughs) Well, that's what they say. You you get to do it. Your favorite things in heaven. It's like, well, my oh, favorite God, thing. What do you have to say about that? It's like, Lord. yeah, like we can, you know, like my favorite thing to do was snort cocaine off a of hooker's tits. Like, I'm going to get to do that in heaven? I really doubt it. Yeah, I mean, I, I have addiction in, in my, you know, in my history. And you're going you to get to do I all mean, the drugs. Is, it, <laughs> I mean, is heaven the, that first pull on the, the yeah, pipe? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You know that. You know, I'm not trying to be blasphemous. It's but, that you know, feeling, it, but for eternity. That yeah, feeling of the first yeah. pull, but forever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. Uh, and so now that we're talking about death. We'll start wrapping this show up at the you know first time first timers on Roddy Radio. We always ask the same question. Uh, it's uh, it, and it goes along the lines of that. If you were to die today, who would your Paul Bears be tomorrow? Oh, that is a good question. Um, well, definitely Mo and Gritty. Um, are you coming? Yeah, I'll, I'll go. That's All right. three of us. Uh, be a Paul Bearer. Uh, my nephew. Um, what do you need? Uh, one, two, six. Six, I believe. Yeah. So Mo Gritty, my nephew, you. Um, I want to say Pastor Simmons, but I don't think. You just let him sit in the pews. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm trying to think. Um, Deacon Jeremy. He's a deacon at the church I serve at i'm assuming that bishop uh tony if he was still alive would do my funeral and one more pallbearer oh derek chaplain derek there you go that's six six right there which is good it's good you never know yeah but every time i finish one of these i'm always kind of scared like what if you do die tomorrow people are gonna blame it on me well at least this is remote so it's harder to blame on me yeah, he really can't blame you. I but mean, when uh, I do a, like an in-person one, you know, I'm like, what if they think I killed him? And that's why I ask. But so far, so well, it, uh, just speaking as a chaplain, uh, uh, generally our society does a very bad job talking about death. Yeah, and that uh, death is a uh, is a part of the cycle of life, and that death uh, can be a beautiful thing. Yep. And I encourage people to not be so afraid of it, but to, uh, you know, maybe find, uh, you know, different uh, reading material or talk to other people that uh, are well adjusted to talk about death. And uh, because we, you know, we live in a society that has great technology that can keep bodies alive. Yeah. And a lot of those bodies shouldn't be kept alive that long. Yeah. A lot of times and, it's just uh, the body running. It's just the machine running, but there's not anything yeah. there anymore. I don't think anyway. But. And that, you know, in that, in that, in that sorrow and grief, um, there, there can be beauty. And you, you know, a lot of times letting loved ones go is the greatest gift you could ever give to your love, give your loved one. Yeah. Very well said. And so I'm glad you came on, Pastor. We'll go ahead and start wrapping this up. There's still so much more to talk about uh, that I know you would be a really good person to talk with. So um, I hope you could come back and and uh, we'll make that happen sure. again. I mean, you know, of course, uh, so people can find your uh, No Name Yet podcast. Where's that? Where where all do you post that up? Uh, no Name Yet podcast at uh, Rumble, um, uh, YouTube and uh apple podcasts and spotify uh we post it up on x also okay and uh yeah i'm thinking of uh trying uh bit shoot and a couple other spots uh but uh that's where we are now 
Awesome. So go find them there. I'm gonna go ahead and link like the YouTube, the Spotify, kind of the basics, and uh, you know, so you can go find No Yami at podcast. You're also, of course, a regular on Gritty Knows Best, as am I now, which is great. So part of the uh, Gritty Knows Best crew, go find that. And uh, I remember that time, uh, Sinead O'Connor, rest in peace. Remember that time she ripped up that, pa- that picture of the Pope? Yeah, that was cool. When I was a kid, I didn't think it was cool because everybody told me it wasn't. But then, like, when I got older, I was like, hey, that was cool. Yeah. Um, you know, she came out and later apologized for that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, 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 societies in general uh, don't embrace the concept of redemption that often. And that uh, she was at a particular place in it at that point in her life and she took the, a huge risk to make a statement and then as she grew she grew into her her catholic faith mm-hmm. and as she she gave uh a sincere apology for doing that yeah um and i i through all of it i just ended up respecting her for um for what she did and you know sometimes people make mistakes yeah see i just think i always thought it was just her not against the religion against the powers of the religion the political that's the way i took it at the time yeah the political aspects of the religion which is what i always appreciated once i was able to like i said when i was a kid i mean everybody demonized her around here but yeah but once you kind of read up and see, like, actually listen to what she said, I was like, yeah, it was pretty cool. But yeah. yeah. But we were um, wrapping up the show. I don't know why that just came to my mind. Was the, yeah. So you need, and she just Well, she, you know, she was, uh, I think she was a, a woman of uh, a great thought. And that uh, she expressed herself in different ways as she developed. And that we do things we're willing to do things at, at younger ages than we're maybe not so willing to do at older ages. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And that, uh, you know, we, we could have, we could afford to respect the arc of people's development. Yeah. Incredible artistry and a great thinker, which is why she didn't have hair. I'll fall out from the thinking. (laughs) Is that what it was? Yeah. I read that in (laughs) in Newsweek or some shit. But uh, anyway, thanks for doing the show, man. We'll get you back on sooner than later, hopefully, and we'll see you on the on the greedy knows best side of things. Also, um, other than that, I think we're out of here. We'll play the little music and we'll uh, we'll part we'll part ways, man. All right. Thank you for asking me to come on. Yeah, for sure. And we'll see you guys next time.